to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the lord jesus christ said i will build my church matthew chapter 16 verse number 18. welcome to our study on the church of christ as we think about the lord's church we ask what do you know about the church of christ maybe you've heard some things maybe you've been taught some things or maybe you've come to learn things and you wonder where are those things at in the bible and what really is the church of christ we welcome you today to this study as always today's lessons are being brought to you by members of the church of christ worldwide if you'd like to have a copy of our lesson today or you'd like to study further on this subject or a host of different Bible studies, you can go to our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We have videos and audio online as well as you can ask questions or study further in a multitude of various ways. As we think about the Church of Christ, we want people to know that in our study of this lesson, the design of this series is simply to say what God says in the Bible. Our ideas are not coming from the ideas of men. We're not trying to promote man's doctrine or man's teaching. We simply want to go to the Bible and ask the question, what is the church of Christ? What do we know about the church of the Bible? And so our aim in this series is simply to speak the truth. The Bible says in Ephesians 4 verse 15, speak the truth in love. We want God's truth, what God says, what the, the Bible has to say to come to the forefront and be our guide in every way. You see, my friend, it is truth that sets us free. Jesus said in John chapter 8 verse number 32, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. And the long ago, Pilate asked in John 18, verses 36 through 38, what is truth? And Jesus gave us that answer. John 17, 17, in praying to the Father, Jesus prayed, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. And so as we think about, as we study about the church of Christ, we want God's truth found in the Bible to be the answer. We want it to be the source that we go to. And friend, what a great source it is and what a valuable source that is. For the proverb writer said in Proverbs 23, verse 23, by the truth and sell it not. Our encouragement today is to look to the truth, to buy it and to live our lives by it in every way. But as we think today about the subject of the church of Christ, not only do we want to speak the truth, we want to speak the truth in love. Again, we emphasize Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, speaking the truth in love. As we think today about the Lord's church, friend, we want people to know that we have a love for the Bible. We have an absolute love for the church that Jesus died for. And we have a love for souls coming into a knowledge of that truth and living as they ought to. And so our aim, our motivation is out of love. Now, love may sometimes say things that challenges or things that are different. Maybe sometimes it challenges us to think about things that we've always been taught. That's still love. For the Bible says in Proverbs 27 verse 5, open rebuke is better than love carefully concealed. And so please understand that in all the series of these lessons, our aim and our motivation is a love for God and a love for the church and lost souls. But as we think about the subject of the church, 
we also want to emphasize that we need this study. There is a need for this study because we want to clearly speak about the things God has set forth in His Word. When we come to the Bible, there's no need to beat around the bush. There's no need to just say it as kind, you know, to say things in a way that people can't understand. We want to speak clearly and plainly about the Lord's church. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse number 2. The scripture says, Run to the man, speak to him, speak to this young man. The Bible says we're to make it so plain that he who runs may read it. I'm reminded of the response of some of Jesus' hearers, and he had already told them this, but they really emphasized the idea. In John 10, verse 25, they said to Jesus, Tell us plainly if you are the Christ. Friend, we want to speak plainly. We don't want to beat around the bush. We don't want to be so concerned about offending somebody that we can't speak truth. We want to plainly say so that there is no misunderstanding what God says about truth. You know, in a day and age today, it seems as though sometimes people are afraid to speak truth. I remember hearing a story one time about someone who was trying to proclaim God's truth and after hearing the lesson the people said he spoke out of one mouth for so long and then once another side of his mouth so long that you really never understood what he was saying we want to plainly say what God says about the church so that there is no misunderstanding from the scripture but you know as we think about as we think about God's truth on the church our main emphasis in speaking these things about the church is ultimately to glorify God. The church is to glorify God in everything that it does. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. God's spokesmen are to preach the word. 2 Timothy 4, verse number 2. And the apostle Paul said, who after he had suffered so much, said in Galatians 1, verse 10, If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Jesus Christ. Our hope and our aim is that there are hearts who are ready to hear truth, but ultimately we want to please God by saying what He has said, by teaching what He has taught in His holy and divine Word about the church. But friend, as we think about this study, our aim in this study, although it is to preach truth plainly and to please God, we're not here to make enemies by preaching the truth. Please understand, when we speak what God has already spoken, 1 Peter 4.11, when we speak from the Bible as the oracles of God, we're not trying to make enemies. In fact, truth doesn't by its very nature do that unless people's hearts are hardened. Paul said this or asked this question. In Galatians chapter 4, verse number 16, the apostle Paul asked, Have I become your enemy? by speaking the truth. Friend, we don't ever become someone's enemy by saying what God says in His book. And so our purpose is not to make enemies. Rather, we want to make people, we want to help people to see what God has said in His Word. Then in this study, we also want to emphasize that our purpose is definitely not to anger anyone. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, the Bible says, parents are to bring up their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We want to, as Hebrews 10 verse 24 says, encourage one another, stir one another up to love and to good works. Maybe as we think about the church and as we notice that it's not denominational, that there's one body, that you can only be saved in the church, maybe that's different than what you've heard. Friend, please understand, our aim is not to anger. Rather, it is to encourage and to promote people to look to their own Bible, see for themselves what the Scripture says, and simply become New Testament Christians. As we think about this study, please understand, we're not saying that members of the Lord's Church are the only sincere religious people. We emphasize sincere because there's no doubt in a multitude of denominations and religions around the world, there are sincere people. And so we're not saying only those in the Lord's church are the, the ones, only ones who are sincere. But sincerity alone will not save. 
Romans chapter 10, verse 2, Paul said, His brethren, he had a great love for his brethren, who had a, a zeal for God but not according to truth. Were the Jews and Paul's brethren of his day sincere? Absolutely. Paul himself, as Saul of Tarsus, was sincere, persecuting Christians, wreaking havoc on the church there when Stephen was stoned. Are there sincere people in denominations today? Absolutely. But friend, let's realize, sincerity alone is not enough. It is possible to be sincere and be sincerely wrong. Truth must be of a premium. Romans chapter 6 and verse 17, the Apostle Paul said, God be thanked that though you were the slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And so in this series, we want to emphasize God's truth that all men can know. Friend, it's very plain. When you come to the Bible, even as we think about the subject like unto the church, that anyone who wants to know God's truth can know that truth and be right with God. Listen again to Jesus' words. John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32. Jesus said, If you continue in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Paul said in Ephesians 5 verse 17, Do not be ignorant, but understand the will of the Lord. When you read, you can understand. Ephesians chapter 3 verse number 4. And so anyone who will take their Bible, will study that with an open and honest heart, can know God's truth and do what He says about the church. But as we think about God's church, and as we think about God's truth, Friend, there is a serious responsibility placed upon every person who hears truth. What is that responsibility? First and foremost, our responsibility is to demand that we want to know and hear truth plainly taught. Again, John 10, 24, they said to Jesus, tell us plainly. A sad thing was happening in Jeremiah 5, verse 30 and 31. The prophets prophesy falsely, the priests rule by their own authority, and God said, but my people love to have it so. And then he asked this question, but what will you do in the end? Friend, there are way too many who are wanting to tickle the ears. There are way too many hirelings who are only saying things because that's what they've been hired to do. Our responsibility is to demand to know truth. Don't tell me what you feel. Don't tell me what you think. Tell me, is there any word from the Lord? Jeremiah 37 verse 17 and Romans chapter 4 verse number 3. And then there is a second powerful responsibility to every person who hears truth. And it's this. We must listen very carefully to what the Bible has to say. Luke 8, 18, take heed how you hear. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 2, people are taught to listen carefully to the Word and the will of God. Acts 17, verse 11, the Bereans were more noble in that they searched the Scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Listen with a view toward eternity. One day I'm going to leave this life. One day you're going to leave this life. And only acceptance of and living by God's truth can save us. John chapter 8, verse 32. And then the responsibility to each of us in hearing God's Word is this. We must apply God's Word to our everyday life. Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, verse 9, the things which you received and heard and saw in me, listen now, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Friend, it's not enough to know and to hear truth. I've got to take that truth and apply it to my heart, apply it to my life, and live by it each and every day. You remember what Jesus said? to those people in His day who were good at mouthing the words but not following the teaching. Jesus said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but do not do the things 
which I say. Luke 6, 46. Why do you call me your Lord and not follow me? It's not enough to, to look up and say, I believe in Jesus. You've got to follow His teaching. I've got to follow His teaching. Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. And so let's now turn our attention to what God's Word has to say about the Lord's church. What is the church of Christ? Or maybe we would approach it by asking, what is the church not? Sometimes to really get a full grasp of something, we need to look at some things maybe that sometimes the church is confused with that the Bible says it is not. And so what the church is not is a very important idea as we come to the Scriptures and as we look at the world around us today. Let's notice this. The Lord's church is not the building. Sometimes we say, when, about the place we worship, we will say, I go to church at. Wait a minute now. The church is not cinder block and walls and stained glass. It's not a location on a street. That's not the church. There's a building there. The church meets there. But friend, the church is not the building. How do we know that? Acts chapter 7, verses 48 through 50 the Bible says, God does not dwell in temples made with hands. As the prophet says, Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. What place shall you build for me, says the Lord. God doesn't dwell in, in buildings made with hands. That's, that's not the church. The church was never intended to be the building. That's a, a major misconception today. In fact, the Bible says, in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27, two Christians, you are the body of Christ and members individually one of another. Now think about it this way. In Acts chapter 20, verse 28, the Bible says that Jesus purchased the church with His own blood. What are we talking about there? Did Jesus die for a building? Did He die for stained glass windows and maybe a nice front door and cinder block and walls and two by fours? Of course not. Jesus didn't purchase the building. Jesus purchased us. Those who have obeyed the gospel, those who have been called out of the world. The church is the people, indeed, not the building. You know, as we think about what the church is not, let's also realize that church is not the same as worship. Sometimes we'll say, are you going to church this morning? And we kind of understand what people are saying. Are you going to meet with the church and worship God? But let's not equate the church with worship. I think sometimes we do that. I've been to Bible class. I've been to worship. I've been to Sunday night. I've been to Wednesday. I have been to church this week. Wait a minute now. You don't go to church. You are the church. There's no doubt that the church worships. John 4, verse 24, the Scripture says, God is a spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. But friend, along this same line of thinking, there's a major problem or misnomer that arises that I think does great harm to the cause of Christ. Sometimes, way too often, our religion revolves around the building. Our religion revolves around coming to worship when in reality, Christianity is something you do 24-7, 365, every waking, breathing moment of our life. It's not where we go or what we do. It's who we are as well. And so Christians are the body of Christ. The church is not the building, nor indeed is it equated with worship. But then there's another misnomer about the church, and it's this. Friend, let's realize the Lord's church is not a denomination. When we think of denomination, the word denomination means to name after another. And it carries the connotation of division. Is naming the church after another or division something God authorizes? Absolutely not. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, listen now, and that there be no divisions among you. Well, Paul, what was the problem? It has been declared to me by you concerning those of Chloe's household that there are contentions or divisions among you. Now, each of you says, I'm of Paul. 
or I'm of Apollos, or I'm of Cephas, or I'm of Christ. Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Of course not. What's the point there? Don't let division occur. What do you mean don't let division occur? Don't name it after Cephas. Don't name it after Paul. Don't name it after Apollos. And so both ideas are as clearly and plainly identified in 1 Corinthians 1.10 as contrary to the will of God. Both division and the naming after another man just aren't found in the Bible. And so when we think about the church, please realize we are not talking about a modern day denomination. What are we talking about? We're talking about the church you read about in the book of Acts. We're talking about the church Christians were a part of in the first century. Friend, wouldn't it be so great to leave all the denominational chaos and confusion and just simply be a member of the church that, that Peter and Paul and, and all those first century Christians were a part of? My friends, that is exactly what the church of Christ is in the Bible and the principle that we're trying to instill from Scripture today. But you know, as we think about the church and identifying what it is not, let's realize the church is not a humanly devised, not a man-made institution. Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, in the long ago, Isaiah prophesied that God's house would be established in Jerusalem. Daniel 2 verse 44, it was to be that eternal kingdom that was set up during the Roman period. Well, did that happen by God? Absolutely. We open our Bible to 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15, and Paul said, These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly, but if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how to conduct yourself, listen, in the house of God which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. Who promised the church would be built? Jesus, God. Who said that it would last forever? God Himself. And so when we think about the church, whose institution, who started it? Not men. They don't have that power nor that ability. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is not a human institution. It was designed and founded by Almighty God. With those things in mind, Let's now direct our attention for the remainder of the time to the question, what is the church of Christ? The church of Christ is simply the called out of God. The word church, ecclesia, in the Greek language literally means called out. You see, we're called by the gospel. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, Paul said to those who were called by the gospel, meaning that when we understand what Jesus did, when we hear about God's plan of salvation, when we obey that gospel, the gospel message plays on our heart. We hear it. We understand it. We want to obey it. And when we respond to that and obey just as they did, those who gladly received the word were baptized in Acts chapter 2. What happened to those people? Verse 47 says, The Lord added them to the church. What's the church? those called out of the world by the gospel to become members of the Lord's body. When we think about the church, we emphasize again, the church is the saints. The church is the people, the saved. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 27, you are the body of Christ and members individually one of another. In fact, Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 12, 20, there are many members, yet but one body. In the one church of the Lord Jesus Christ, there the members are, the people, those who have responded to God's call. But as we think about the church, let's also notice this. The church that you read about in the Bible belongs to and is possessed by, meaning He owns it, by Jesus Christ. The church belongs to Christ. The Bible says in Matthew 16 verse 18, Jesus speaking, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Friend, I ask you this question, just simply, plainly, common sense, who does the church belong to according to Matthew 16 18? Jesus said, I'm going to build John Calvin's church. 
That's not what he said. Jesus said, I'm going to build John Wesley or John Smith's church. Not what he said. What did Jesus say? I will build my church. You know, in everyday common sense language, we understand that. For example, let's say that you buy a home. Are you going to tell your neighbor when you pay the final payment on that home, when the deed is yours, if somebody came to your door and said, whose home is this? Would you say, well, I paid for it, but it's my neighbor's next door. Well, of course not. That's my home. That's my car. Why? I paid the debt. I paid the note. It belongs to me. Friend, why do we think any differently about the church? Acts chapter 20, verse 28. The Bible says Jesus purchased the church with His own blood. Who does it belong to? It, it doesn't belong to men today. It doesn't belong to people who had some kind of religious ideas 1,500 or 1,000 or 500 or yesterday. Who does it belong to? The church belongs to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Friend, we want to think more about the Lord's church and in the lessons that go along with this series. We'll have a host of more, a, a host of identifying characteristics by which you can know the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We hope that you'll continue with us in our study. Each of these lessons will be identifying things about the church that we simply find in the Bible. But remember, our aim in saying this is to speak the truth in love because we want people to go to heaven. And ultimately, we want to let the Bible have the say. Friend, we ask you today, are you a member of the Lord's church? Have you obeyed the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Have you heard the word? Romans 10 verse 17. Do you really believe Jesus is God's Son? John chapter 8 verse 24. W would you believe it enough to change your life and repent? Acts 3 verse 19. Would you make that good confession and be immersed in water so that you can be saved? Acts chapter 2 verse 38. If you've never done that, we encourage you to in view of the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is taking the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we do and say. And unlike many other religious groups, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. The gospel of Christ and to God be the glory. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905, or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.